Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and this is my spare parts free NAS build that we kind of put together to kind of demonstrate setting up free NAS with spare parts in less than ideal, but still be able to get some performance out of it and just kind of show the setup process. If you want to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hire us button up at the top. If you want to support this channel in other ways, some affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. And I've been talking a lot about free NAS, and this is just, like I said, spare parts. I uh, will start with what these drives are in front of me by showing you the login to the free NAS here. We've got nothing built, um, but let's talk about some of the parts. So I have a couple of the drives here, like uh, this one, and that's in this pile here of three and a half inch hard drives is this Toshiba desktop 7200 RPM drive. That's 500 gigs, so nothing real in performance here. Let's see, what do we have at ADA zero? That's a Seagate Constellation. That's some of the two and a half inch drives. Let's look at uh, three, another Seagate Constellation. And I hodgepodge these together. What's at nine? Oh, we got a Seagate Barracuda. So mostly Seagates, but there is at least one Toshiba in the mix here. And let's try this one, six. And yep, another uh, Seagate one terabyte constellation in here. So kind of got a mix of some of the different parts in here as far as hard drives. So we got some three and a half inch hard drives here and all the two and a half inch hard drives are over here. The Seagate constellations are on the bottom. Uh, this fan is because these little Seagate constellation drives, which have plenty of hours on them from a old server that was decommissioned, um, but they won't cool themselves very well. They kind of expect to have the tray cooling them. So when we printed a little 3D holder for all the drives, it turns out not to work very well in terms of cooling. So we got a fan sitting here. Uh, but uh, what I'm gonna demonstrate here is we have five one gig drives and five 500 drives. And yes, you can put mismatched drives together for FreeNAS. And I've done a video before showing how, yes, you can expand your FreeNAS volume with another VDEV of different size drives. And we're gonna do this from the beginning, but yes, this is something you can do, and I have another video about that. Now, this is not the same as expanding a single VDEV, but VDEVs are what make up a pool inside of FreeNAS. I'll link to a bigger explainer I have on all the details and uh, diving into that. But let's start with this here. We're gonna go and uh, we have eight gigs of RAM. We do have, uh, let me move it slightly out of the way, if you can really see, oh, we get the overhead here. Um, this is a Mellanox 10 gig single DAC connector. So this will have 10 gig speed and that is uh, you know adequate for what we're doing here. Eight gigs of RAM is adequate for what we're doing here. And uh, let's take a look at the system itself. This is a, go to the dashboard. We've already got free NAS loaded. This is a Intel Core i7 4770K. So it's an i7, which is nice. It's liquid cooled, as you can see by the little rigging we have over here, but it's nothing, it's an older board. It's probably five or six years old. Uh, it is a Republica gamer board, um, but it's not ideal, so, so to speak, for free NAS. This is all the parts we had laying around. Now let's run through just what the free NAS installer looks like. That's what I have set up here. So let me refresh this. And I'm not going to go through the install process completely because it's kind of boring, uh, but at least I'll show you for those wondering what it looks like. Now, FreeNAS does have the ability when you run the installer, which you just download it, put it to a boot drive, um, and then you want to install it somewhere. We're not installing FreeNAS on any of the data drives. Now, this is, once again, not ideal, but based on a spare parts build, we put this on a little SanDisk Cruiser USB. Uh, you can install FreeNAS to USB if you're in a pinch. It will work. It doesn't have to be much in terms of the boot drive because not a lot's going on. And if you have a pair of USBs, you could even choose rating them together. And then we hit OK. Would you like to proceed with the installation? Installing flash media is preferred. Installing on a hard drive uh, it does have that option. And I say in a pinch, you can do um, the FreeNAS onto a USB. FreeNAS does, you know, completely support that. But USB ones, sometimes we found those not to be 100% reliable. They work overall pretty good. We've got some installed for years that have never had a problem. And the reason for that is once you get this set up, you take your syslog and you don't point it at the USB. You point your syslog or any type of logging um, over here. Because once it reads from a USB, it doesn't write back to it unless you're making changes, which aren't very often. All the data sets handle all the rest of it. And then you set your free NAS password. boot via BIOS or boot via uh, UEFI, kind of depends on the motherboard you're using, but um, in this case, we actually set it up to boot via BIOS. 
it's going to run and do the setup. It's going to copy the files and reboot. So not much to this, uh, to getting free NAS set up. Like I said, I just wanted to show it in this little VM here so we can get you an idea. And I'm actually going to go ahead and force shut down this. So I don't need this running. And we're going to cover a couple quick topics right here. And I'll leave a link to this. This is a good read up on here. So ZF S allocates rights according to free space per VDEV, not latency per VDEV. Why am I bringing it up? We're going to be creating a VDEV with the 500 gig drives, and we're going to be creating a VDEV with the one terabyte drives, and then we're going to merge both of these into one single pool. Well, actually, you create the pool and you just set the VDEVs. We'll get into the actual creation process just in a second. So this write up is uh, to break down the fact that some people have comment to this. And I think these comments are still on my video from a while ago of how to expand uh, a pool with adding VDEVs that are different sizes. And there's this myth that it allocates rights based on latency. And that's not true. And what happens when you have imbalanced VDEVs, because we're going to be creating some of these on the uh, 500 gig drives and some of these on the one terabyte drives, well, you've got double the space. That means for every file written, it's going to put let's say, call them blocks per se, uh, a couple blocks over here and one block over here, a couple blocks over here and one block over here. And this is how it's going to balance it. So it doesn't wait and right here, fill this up and then flow over to here or fill this one up and flow over to here. It distributes them evenly based on their size. So it kind of creates a calculation going, well, this is only 500 gigs. So it has half the capacity of the one terabyte ones and it will balance them by putting for every two writes it does over on the one terabyte series, it puts half of that over on here. So uh, this article actually breaks it down. This person has a lot of good demos and testing. And of course, someone always asks, what if I already had data and then I expanded it? Uh, he has a whole how the drive system rebalances. It's a fun read and something de uh, definitely worth looking into. And I'll leave those links uh, down below and in a forum post uh, where all this will be done. So now that we've kind of got the concept of what we're doing, let's actually do it and show it working. So we're gonna go over here to pools and we're gonna add. Now this only had 10 SATA ports, so that only gives me the potential for 10 drives. And people always ask, what about a caching drive? What about a, a ZIL or a log drive on there? Well, those are more for performance systems with specific use cases. Uh, let's say you're having um, NFS rights and you really want a ZIL drive on there to help buffer all that. That can help, but you have to remember when you have 10 drives in a pool, you actually have a lot of this buffering going on where it's going to distribute the rates across here and, of course, distribute the reads. And what I mean by that is you're going to get a pretty reasonable amount of performance even though we don't have a cache drive. So I'm more likely in this particular scenario with these are all 7200 RPM drives to get a better performance out of these than if I would have sacrificed one of these drives, um, sacrificed some of the storage for that zill log on there but that's i don't want to get too deep and technical on there also if you are using something like a zill you really should be using it as an mvme because if it's not performance and it doesn't have a really fast ability to uh, read and write the data it's not going to help these either same thing goes for a cache drive cache drives will do caching for frequently asked as files there are use cases use cases specific for that but once again, if you have the ability to put more RAM in there, uh, that is faster because your first cache hits are going to come from RAM, and then it will start looking at the level two cache, which could be a hard drive. But uh, if you can put more RAM in, obviously that would be much better because the more memory you can have, the more it can cache those files. Also, the other myth that you have to have a massive amount of memory to get any real performance out of FreeNAS. It will perform better with memory because, yes, you'll be able to cache things in memory but it's not imperative that you have memory. You can still create this drive setup we're doing here without that much RAM. So we do have eight gigs of RAM in here and that's purposely, I actually have more RAM I could have put in, but we're gonna show the performance in a setup of our spare parts build with only eight gigs of RAM. Now, if you try to do things like run VMs and things like that in here, which we're not for this demo, obviously that would have definitely affect your amount of RAM you need. So let's go back to creating a pool and uh, Let's see, we'll suggest a layout. There we go. It grabbed all these and said, let's put all these into the first data VDEV. And uh, we're just going to do them at a RAID Z1, which means we can lose one drive. RAID Z2 means you can loot up to two drives for parity. So it kind of depends on what's your risk factor on doing it. RAID Z2, less risk uh, at the sacrifice of losing more space. But RAID Z2, um, you know, I... I I feel as though I can just rebuild a drive in here and it shouldn't be too big of a deal. So we'll go RAID Z1, which means if I lose two drives, it's done. Also, if I lose two drives out of here and two drives out of here, 
it's completely done. It doesn't matter which side you lose them on, it needs both VDEVs to be there. So if I lose two drives on this VDEV, it's not like the data over here is safe. The data is written across all VDEVs. So that that is definitely a factor uh, when you're doing it. So now if I try to add these to this VDEV, that's not gonna work. That's going to go, nope, it will say these are mismatched drives. So we're gonna go ahead and click down here and say add data. And what that does is now I can select these drives and that's how we build the second VDEV. So this is the first VDEV here and the second VDEV here. So we have an estimated capacity of 3.63 terabytes and 1.36 terabytes down here. So obviously this one, like I said, is gonna be a lot bigger. So once we've done that, we gotta give it a name. We'll call it Orion. I do like doing encryption on these. Uh, that's because if ever you have a drive, you have to send back you know, because the drive quits reading. Obviously, there's some worry that maybe some data might be on there. If you have it encrypted, that worry just goes away. The downside of if you set this up with encryption and a password and you have lost said encryption and password or you don't back up the encryption key that's going to get written to the drive over here, the uh, boot drive of the Freelance itself, then you also have lost all your data. So please, it, it reminds you throughout uh, to back that up, but it's just something really important. We'll switch this one down here to say RAID Z. So now they match. And because you, you can set it right here, but they do have, each VDEV has to match and we'll hit create. Create pool. This is where it's gonna warn you, download the encryption key. Please back this up. This is the key file you need. And what this means is if the boot drive, the little SanDisk USB that I have plugged in the back of this motherboard were to ever fail, then you definitely need to uh, have that key with your restore. So that's just what that's doing right there. It's I like that they've put more emphasis on this with older versions of FreeNAS. I used to have to say it now, anytime you build an encrypted pool, it definitely uh, prompts you for it. So now we have this all created, but how fast is it? How well does it work? Well, let's go ahead and cover that real quick. So we're gonna go over here and uh, let's create a share on it. Now, as far as uh, this setup, even though I didn't walk the install, the only thing different from this install from like the absolute out of the box, I'll go over here to system, general, and I check the little box right here because actually by default, it doesn't have HTTPS turned on. And if we go over to the services, uh, I do turn on SSH. So SSH is turned on right now. Uh, those are the only out of the box configs from default that this is configured on. So let's go back over here and create a share. So sharing. Actually, first, getting ahead of myself here. Create a data set. I could just share the raw data set itself, but we actually want to create one. Demo share. There we go. Comments. Uh, we don't really need any. Let's call it demo. Save. Now we've got the demo share created. Then we're going to go over here to sharing. Window share. Add. There's the demo share, allow guest access, advanced. And we're gonna say only allow guest access. Now what that's doing, and I've got another video where I break down ACLs and permissions. Um, you are going to, when you say only guests, you're allowing guests and say don't need a password, I can just log into this, so it's an open share. Um, and we're actually gonna change here to open. And like I said, I have another video on how to get more fine grained on ACL permissions and groups. But for the purposes of this, I just wanted to have a wide open share um, and then you set the ACL to open. We're gonna go down here and hit save. And now we have this demo share. And now from this point, we're gonna jump over to my desktop and start copying files to it to kind of see what kind of performance we get on it. But for the most part, FreeNAS, as long as you have a uh, reasonably modern system, it runs pretty well on here. It will uh, boot off of most any system. The only thing before we leave this little setup here and go to my office I wanted to comment on is uh, I have the monitor up here because because it created all of these, the BIOS tries to outsmart me each time and it sees partition changes on these. So the next time I reboot, it's going to mix up the order of the drives. Uh, I've, we've actually noticed this on a couple of the motherboards. Once you've written it, it's fine, but then you have to go change the boot order again to be the boot order you want. The good news is there's no danger after you build these drives. Uh, it'll tell you, hey, this is a free NAS data drive. You cannot boot off it. That's all you'll end up with on the screen. And I've seen people kind of panic on that. Uh, 
simple workaround, like I said, you go back in the BIOS and we've observed this on several consumer motherboards where it just kind of goes, hey, you wrote partitions. We think that means you must have loaded an operating system and want to change the boot order again. Um, you could probably get around that with turning UEFI on and installing it in a UEFI, or maybe if we weren't using USB, it would do it, but I've seen them do it even when I'm installing it to a hard drive, uh, it sees the partition changes. So I'll just leave that as a note, uh, but now we'll go in my office and let's see how fast this is when we dump some data to it. All right, so I'm sitting back at my desk and let's take a look at the shares here. So Mount Orion demo shares the path, demo shares the name, pretty simple. We're gonna go here and you go to, and press control, well, if you're using Linux, Windows, you know, backslash, backslash, the IP address. And when Linux, it's SMB colon slash slash. And we're using an IP address, not the full like name of the system, but that is a possibility as well. Uh, 192.168.3.209 slash demo share. And we have this folder. Now, before we jump all the way over to there, I mentioned that this was connected at 10 gigs. So let's SSH into that server. We're just going to do a quick test. And this will help you. Oops, I meant dash S. Uh, this will help you a lot because the first thing you want to know is can your system talk to the free NAS system in this case at full 10 gigs because if it can't well then your file troubleshooting woes uh, don't begin there i've had people say well i'm not getting the file transfer speeds they want let's first look if you can connect to that system at full speed then you can start whittling down where the problem is so this system fully connected at uh, 9.4, okay, 10 gigs. So that's what we want. We are seeing definitely good connection there. Go ahead and exit out and uh, do this. And while we're waiting, we'll type uh, zpool iostat orion-v1. That should work. All right, and this will show the writes going on to the drive when we copy some files over. Go here, and I grabbed a couple folders, and we'll just copy them, some backup folders in my system, and paste them over. Let's see what kind of performance we get out of there. Now, it's going to start out sometimes with like a really high number, and as you know, when file transfers, it takes a second to either ramp up or slow down to the speed that it actually transfers at. Not bad at about 300 megabits a second right now. So that's actually pretty reasonable. 299 megabytes a second. Going back up, 290, oh, 297. We'll let this run for a second and look at what's going on in the background over here. But you can see it committing all the writes to this. And slowly as it's going, you're going to watch the um, allocation here. There we go. Move the uh, dash V over there so you can see it actually reading and writing to each of the pools. And as I'd said, it's gonna start distributing this data across these pools and across the writes. Something to note here, if you have slower drives in one of the VDEVs, so one VDEV has faster drives than the other, it doesn't mean you're going to aggregate get better performance overall. You'll actually slow it down. It does have to wait for these, some of these writes to commit to the other drive. So if you do have a couple slow drives in your pool, especially because we use such a mismatch of not even the same brand drives, it can't operate really more than the slowest drive in your pool. I mean, there's still some factors. It may still be a little bit faster, but it may pause when it gets to that particular drive. So something to consider when you are adding these when it comes to performance. But generally when you're building a bunch of hodgepodge mismatch stuff together, um, it's not to build a performance system. It's building on what you have, or in many cases, sometimes just a backup system. And we've built backup free NAS systems for clients, or you, know, uh, you take an older server, like, hey, this server has some of these drives and some of these drives, but we just need a big storage repository for all of your backup stuff and that can go over here and it's usually like the you know the last generations of servers they can be repurposed for that and then your new generation servers run all of your primary but it's nice to have you know an extra on-site backup with hardware that it will still perform pretty well and despite this being a little bit older of a system let's see what kind of transfers it's getting now that it's run for a while we're up to actually 317 megs a second and I grabbed this because there's a big, wide variety of files uh, mixed in here. So 15,000 files in here. Some are small, some are big. Uh, if you did something, and we could probably cancel this real quick and started doing it as, uh, this is an X in front of it. If we just did ISOs, which is going to be, how big is this? About 25 gigs with the ISOs. And we drop them over here. 
they'll probably transfer faster because it's just large files being transferred, not a bunch of small files where it has to be as much uh, activity on the SMB. So let's see what this transfer is at. Yeah, still only about 300. It looks like some of the other ones were hitting the 320 mark. So it gives you a good idea though that well, 300 megabytes a second out of a handful of old hard drives in here um, it is still pretty reasonable. Now, if we want to do the Z2, I figured we'll do one more setup and do it Z2 and just run, run through the same setup uh, and see how much Z2 hurts us in performance. Uh, we know it's going to lose a little bit of space, but then we do gain that extra redundancy. So if we're getting 300 meg a second on a Z1 with these pairs, let's just tear them down and rebuild them in a Z2 format. So I'll go ahead and cancel this. Control C, and we'll just do that. And let's go ahead and uh, kill these drives off real quick. So the pools. Export disconnect, destroy the data. By the way, if you do not destroy the data, um, you will have probably you'll have to re-import them or um, blank the drives because what happens is if you don't destroy the data on a pool, it's expecting you to bring them back in and FreeNAS will give some warnings that you didn't erase these drives and it's to protect you from accidentally overwriting them. Um, that it. It's just one of those things that you want to destroy them if you plan on uh, exporting them and uh, destroying them out to be reused in a pool again like we're going to do. But if you wanted just to not destroy them so you could just export the pool, you could do that. But we actually want to fully destroy these because we're going to re-pull uh, re them back in. Also, SMB demo share. Um, it does recognize there's a share in there and it'll say, hey, you want to get rid of this too and restart service. No problem. Reconfiguring data set to none, and then we'll go ahead and restart the process. Okay, all the data on the pool was destroyed. So we can create a new pool, do the same setup again. Call this one Orion Z2. Consistent naming here. Add another data. So Z2 there, Z2 there, all right. And uh, keep the encryption. Understand, confirm, create, create pool, download encryption key, done, pool, add data set, demo Z2. Z2 share, cool. Save. Sharing Samba. Demo share. Advanced, same thing. We're just going to allow guest access. Only allow guests. Save. Configure. Open ACLs. Save and confirm that I have read write access over here. Cool. I definitely can read write data to it. And let's see what kind of transfers we get now. We'll do the same thing. We'll grab both of these and give it a few minutes to ramp up and write some data. Let's see if the Z2 has much of a performance hit. So I'll let this run for a little while, and even with Z2, we're still seeing over 300 megabytes a second in transfer. That being said, what does the cache look like and what does the performance of the system look like? Well, I predict pretty safely here that we've used all of the memory towards cache. So free memory, 0.2 gigs, not much. ZFS cache allocated, 6.8 gigs. Services running on the system only account for one gig. Like I said, FreeNAS does not need a massive amount of memory to get high performance out of a system in terms of not super high performance, obviously, but a reasonably fast system right here, being able to transfer it that with the 10 gig card. So over that breaks the myth of the memory and even having mismatched drives in here that are of a random assortments, not even the same brands, all of them. There's a handful that are the same, but not all of them are the same. Uh, mismatched sizes, of course, to go with that. And um, yeah, we're still able to transfer at a pretty reasonable rate on this particular system. 
So last thing we'll do is go over to the reporting. We can see how much CPU is being used, which there's definitely some. It's you know hitting probably some limitations with SMB going, okay, I'm gonna pin out this particular process. We can go over the reporting and also look at like the ZFS. We can see the arc size, hit ratio. Uh, so it is, you know, pulling some data and, and definitely lining it up when I'm pulling it back from there. Some things are getting loaded and ran to make it a little faster. And uh, then we can look at the disks as well. So we look at the disks and let's actually select uh, all the devices and metric wise, IO, latency, and why not? Let's just select all. You can see the temperature. Well, they did get warmer. I'll scroll down here, IO activity which you're seeing it very evenly spread across all the drives. So now we get to disk IO itself, which by the way, this is the DA0 is the little USB drive. That's the boot pool. These are the, all the data drives on there. You can see there's very little at all that gets written there. All the activity happens on all of those drives here. So you can see the disk busy. Once again, kind of lines up much the same. Scroll down here. Now we have the latency to look at. And you can see the different latency. Now this is gonna change a little bit from the drives because some of the latency is gonna be varied based on the ability of these drives to handle something. So whether they're waiting for another drive or not. So there's probably a little bit of variation in this. But it's kind of interesting to see, you know, all the data going across. So that's it for this free NAS build. Like I said, you can get an idea now that yes, it'll work. And hopefully this broke a couple of the myths. Yes, you can have mismatched DDEVs. And yes, you can have only eight gigs of RAM, but still have a system um, and it's probably done transferring. Yeah, it's done transferring, but, you know, it was able to transfer at a pretty reasonable speed there at uh, between three and 400 megs, kind of bounce around depending on the type of file transfers on there. Not the highest performing machine, but still not bad for a bunch of spare parts. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.